about the so let's talk just a little bit about the firings. So we had a meeting on the two the Thursday. By we, you mean the the paid staff the, of the of the party? Yes. Yeah, so there were there was the executive director. Now we all now this is what's funny. We all came in. In Jan, well, not January. Some of us came in in January, so probably January through March. And if you could hear all the bragging that went on, they were just amazed at all the work that was being done. People that were at the executive committee's candidates, I mean, um, the former chair had sent out a postcard to let people know here's the dates of trainings, put our information down that if you need anything, I got calls you know to help candidates even though we had a person that's supposed to help so you're doing the work you're doing real work to help candidates like that's your goal and i think people should know too like you had this goal of engaging voters like you weren't planning events just to you know have events it was like you wanted to get people engaged and want them to come to these events like you were really focused on energizing the the people who needed to get out there and vote and i think that that's something that the party you know what steal it from her because they're failing miserably and we're about to see a bloodbath come november in my opinion but go on well let let me back up so people can get this timeline down so we had a staff meeting uh the executive director we had an Eastern Panhandle regional director who was being funded from private donations from the people in the Eastern Panhandle. We had a data person which was being funded from a grant from the DNC. So I was outreach director. I was funded from a grant from the DNC. Um the comms person had already quit, so we didn't have a comms person. Um, the financial person, which was, now that was the only long-term employee that had been with the other administration. So that's who the meeting was with. Uh, Dan- Danielle Walker, who is the vice chair, she, she's a person. She's also the delegate up here in Morgantown. Huh? Also a delegate up here in Morgantown. Yeah, delegate. So Mike, Mike Pushkin's a delegate, and Daniel Walker's a delegate. They came. We had we had our staff meeting. There was no mentioning that we were going to be leaving. In fact, da- I, you know, we shared the events that were you know what we were working on, and in fact, Danielle gave some very complimentary, um, you know, opinions, and then she also you know, gave suggestions on some of the things that we were working on. So we were sort of like, okay, well, maybe Mike's going to honor what he had said to other people who were concerned that he was going to come in and immediately fire the staff. So we're like, okay, well, maybe we just thought, maybe we thought. We misjudged him. He's a good guy. Yeah, maybe we misjudged him. Now he's chair. Maybe he's going to do the right thing. And so, you know, during that, I you know, from March through June, I had put 3,000, I traveled 3,000 miles just within the state of West Virginia. That doesn't count the trips to the DNC, you know, to DC. Right. And so we got the call Friday, a little bit after the announcement that the Supreme Court had uh, overturned or was it overturned Roe versus Wade? They gutted it. We got a call from Mike Pushkin saying that our services would no longer be required. One well, final said, abortion. I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned that, well, Mike, I have verbal contract. Nah, I didn't care. Mike does what Mike wants. Like We just learned that with the women. We just discussed this. If Mike wants it, Mike does it. Yes. And this is like, I'm like, who is, who is, I don't think he's listening to anybody because he has ticked off so many people during his short time. And like I said, it's not that we weren't doing work because P- I had candidates that are with West Virginia and can't wait that were bragging on the party. They were like, I've never seen the party do so much work. And they were like, you are you got fired? I mean, they were just totally shocked that he, he fired the regional director. He fired the executive director. He fired the data person. He realized he had to keep the financial person because 
after she started talking about everything that had to be done, they realized this is beyond what we could handle. He can't, only person he kept on is the person that he made Belinda hire, who rumors have been that they are in some type of relationship, but that's just a rumor. I have no facts to back that up. We're so not saying that's true. That's something I'm that people are saying. It. And I think that's inappropriate, honestly. You know, that's neither I, here nor there. It's not I'm our business. Saying. No, and it's not important. We're saying what people are saying, and that's what people need to realize. Yeah, so that's the rumor that, you know, all of us who. It was a conflict of interest. And if it's true, it does show that there's. Are we doing what's best for the party or are we doing what's best for Mike? Are we doing what's best yeah. for minorities or are we doing what's best for Mike? And I think every time it comes around, the answer is seemingly, it looks like we're doing what's best for Mike because Mike is the one up there and he's taking all the glory. And um, it's kind of disgusting to watch, you know, the way that they're, they're, just, you know, stomping all over people left and right while claiming to be the ones fighting for us. It's not, it's not true. If they, if that was true, he wouldn't have financially harmed a hardworking black Appalachian woman who was doing her job and doing it well, getting praise from people at the DNC left and right. From my understanding, I mean, I've heard good things about you from people who don't know that I know you. That's the kind of work that you were doing. You were making an impact. And Mike said, no, no more because I dislike you. And what's what's the replacement doing? What's where are we at now in terms of helping candidates, in terms of energizing people out there? Because I think the Republicans are going to do quite well uh, come November. There's even a couple of seats that I, I didn't. I don't know. You know, I wasn't sure about, but I think they're going to definitely go to the Republicans. And well, is that- I know that I, especially after this Roe versus Wade thing, that I the the rumors that I'm hearing is that. People feel like in West Virginia, they're not taking this approach nationally, but in West Virginia, they feel like, well, this is the time to get rid of the bad Democrats. Hey, we got to clean house. I mean, we are at, we're practically at rock bottom. I understand it. We've got to clean house. If we don't get rid of these bad Democrats, what message do we send that we're, oh, we just, we really care about party affiliation. That's the most important thing. It's not about getting the right things done. It's about making sure that our party wins. Well, that's what the people who are in charge of the party want, because it's like, okay, it's like the prosecutors uh, across the United States who are elected. And there's so much prosecutorial misconduct where they may know somebody's innocent, but they're still going to try the case because they've had the evidence and they think they can get a conviction or they'll take a, you know, they think, Oh, I'm not going to be able to win this case. And they'll offer a plea bargain and get it to be taken. Their main goal is to just say, I have all wins or I have way more wins than I have losses. It's the same thing with a chair of a party. It's the same thing with the people who work in a party or who have a position within that party. It's ingrained in you that you have to promote Democrats at every level. So, like, that's the thing that people need. I mean, it's just not it's not it's not advisable for the average person. So if you hear an official saying that, understand that, of course, they have to say that to keep their place. In order to have standing in the party, you have to do what they tell you to, um, to a certain extent. And when you don't, you get, you get in trouble, um, just socially. And, you know, it's a lot of peer pressure is involved in this. And I think that that's what a lot of people don't realize. And that's what we've got to, you know, really fight back against too. And so go back to what you were saying. I just little side note. Well, it's just, I mean, it's just been. I, and I'm not saying that this part's not coming from, you know, people who are the party heads. I mean, they're going to vote Democrat, vote blue, no matter who. This is coming from, especially a lot of women who are like, yeah, I know that we need to get the Republicans out, but they feel like Democrats are a hindrance too. And they're supposed to be standing up for our rights and our freedoms. And you have some that are not, and they are sick and tired of it. And they realize that there's, I mean, there's just no chance in hell. I mean, it's just hard. Well, how are you going to win so elections? Super majority of the Republicans in this election right here. What are they offering? What are we offering as, as the Democratic Party? And I still include myself in that, even though I quit my caucus. So what are we offering the voters? What do we have to say, hey, this is why you need to vote for Democrats locally. 
yeah, okay, you don't like the Democrats nationally. Who does? You know, they could even take that approach that they love to take, throwing the national Democrats under the bus. But they aren't making the case that they are actually better. And I don't see the evidence that they are. I don't see the evidence that they are. So I, the only thing they have is good words, nice words that make people feel good. And it works for a certain population, but that's kind of the choir you're preaching to. How are you going to get people to, to think the Democrats actually have their best interest at heart when everything that you're doing kind of proves otherwise? Throwing out good, hardworking people just so that you can install your own little puppets or whoever. I don't, I don't even understand because he even brought back some old people that were hired that were under Belinda Bia for like, um, Kurt Zikafus. He brought him back on to work kind of temporarily while they come in. To I don't understand. So if, is it just the figurehead change? So everything's different. If the, if the core establishment is the same, most of the people on the executive committee are the same. A lot of the people that were under Belinda Bia for, for the most amount of time, they're still, there, still doing their job. What exactly so another, changed other than the, the look? That's another misconception is that, oh, the, the progressives came in and took over. A lot of the people just didn't run again, too. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of the old guard that decided, OK, I'm through. OK, they want it. I'm just giving, you know, because they even had there's a lot of executive committees they were very active and they had to do a lot of appointments because people just did not run this time. Mm. So right. You're losing, you're energy. losing motivation. And right. this, and, so and you know, that I was running, you know, I was going around from, I, from executive committee to executive committee, trying to energize them uh, so that, you know, and that people would know that we were out there working and, um, when Mike, even when Mike fired me, you know, I had been sick. I was still on the phone coordinating volunteers for an event that we had in Southern West Virginia. That was going on in the middle. So he may consider my day to be ended at fri- on that Friday, but I had to keep on, I kept on working because that's who I am. I mean, that's so I what, guess, so what do you I call it when, when, what do you call it when somebody works for free? I guess I was just a slave. Oh no, Marianne, you went racial with it. I would never. I would. I mean, just a slave. So it's fine as long as you're, you know, doing the the work of the slave master. But as soon as you say something that the slave master disagrees with, then you're kicked off. Which I'm waiting on them to come up. <laughs> I think with it's worse control. than getting kicked off. They want to punish as well. I'm going to get kicked off of the executive committee some way. I'm, I'm sure that they're working on that change of the bylaws for something that they'll think about. Something they'll have to bring, they'll have to do a trial. According to Robert's rules, they would have to do a trial. Uh, so, and it would have to be an executive closed session. I don't think you're actually going to get voted off. You're safe. So I, unless no, you, I unless you start building a coalition of people, then they might. I don't think so. I, th- I think that it would be the, the numbers that they have. Yeah. This, it would happen. I would love to see it happen. I really would. I know. It won't be the first time I got kicked <laughs> off of something, will it? No, well, you say, you've, I've been kicked off of better so clubs than this. You know that? And just totally, you're <sighs> off the that's weird, you know. I I'm I was kicked off the Federation of Democratic Women for speaking out against Joe Manchin. I know. When are people going to take a look and say they're two years behind us every time, Marianne? We told them about Joe Manchin in 2018. Everyone jumped down our throats. We're telling them about Mike Pushkin now. No one's believing us. And you know, it it it's like it's the same thing that happened with with our story at the AAC. You know, we experienced outright discrimination. We had okay, so let's just give a quick rundown of okay, our discrimination. Me go, let, let me finish up the rest of the Mike's story, and then okay, yeah, because it might be a longer story. Go ahead, finish that up, and then we'll tell about our discrimination. Okay, so the other thing it, it kind of plays into it. So here's something else that has people in uproar. So apparently, you know, I never had a whole bunch of voter access network, you know, um, whatever you could do on permissions. That. I never had, Permissions. Okay. I never had a whole bunch of that, but apparently the other people who were (laughs) fired have always, even when they weren't in this position. So people got to understand they hadn't been in these positions a long time, but they, the other people have been working for the party as volunteers. And so they had access 
to to be able to do other things. Well, they went in there and cut cut a lot of the access. Some people didn't have access at all. The um, so the former the 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 interim executive co- director that he fired. Uh, she is also the caucus, the Senate caucus. I don't know what they call them. Just that she works for the Senate. Mm-hmm. And, right. Well, they went through and cut all of their access. They had to fight to get their access back so that they could pull lists. You know, that's your walking list. That's where you pull your list to know where you want to send your mailers. It was a mess. So everything was pr- shut down for a, for a little bit. And so, I mean, so they've ticked off the senators, our West Virginia senators. They've, they've ticked off the Federation of Democratic Women. Who knows who else has been ticked off that we just haven't heard through the grapevine. But it, it was just a mess. And so I guess now uh, you got to get approval when you're exporting lists. But I think we always had to get approval to export mm-hmm. this. So I guess yeah, we, we did trust it. <laughs> we didn't. Yeah, no. Well, that. we weren't. So you said this is I, the word you kept saying was messy. So I think that we should start calling Mike Messy Mike. Messy Mike. Well, I, I didn't. You know, now we're just realizing that apparently we weren't trusted to pull list when we were running for auditor. We weren't trusted with information that the AAC was given. Like, we weren't whatever. We're either. not trusted with anything. We're untrustworthy people. I know. So we couldn't. I mean, because I was like, well, I didn't know that you all were able to pull lists and not get approvals because my campaign manager always had to get approval to pull lists. Please, Mr. Kurt, can I please have this list, please? (laughs) (laughs) And then he would ignore me for days on end. (laughs) I mean, it was so times. I didn't realize it. Well, that's because, now let's be clear. I mean, a lot of these people we're talking about, there's personal, there's a little bit of personal history with, not personal, it's, ostensibly professional, but you know, they get under your skin and things, you know, like I remember Kurt and I kind of got into a, a heated debate about whether or not you were, <laughs> I, I forget what it was about, but it was at that house that Doug Reynolds owns on the waterfront there. No, uh, I think, it, no, no, it wasn't Doug Reynolds. That was Chris Regan, who was, I was one of those rich white guys. Before. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he challenged Belinda before for the chair. And then he mm-hmm. just kind of went off on his own now. Yeah, I think he that. might be in Ohio or something. I, you know, that's one of the things that bothers me. There's a lot of people that once they lose here, they just move on. And, well, um, I was told when I was, after I um, ran for auditor, I was told by another black person that once you run in West Virginia as a black person and and they weren't for you, like you ran up against an establishment person, which is what we did, mm-hmm. that uh, you won't see the Democratic Party the same way. We sure don't. <laughs> like that was, and it wasn't just like the experience of 2016. That's out there for people uh, if they want to know. Um, you know, the party did. Know. Like it was, we went up against the Mansion pick in the primary, beat him badly. Um, oh my, my window thing fell down. I'm washed out here. You go ahead and tell some more stories. I'm going to go fix that. And people may feel like, wonder why did I take on that position of outreach director? Well, I kind of was doing it already for free, not saying I was doing it to pump up the Democrats per se. I just wanted people to get engaged in the political process. And, you know, I felt like we needed to energize our base. So I'm not going to, you know, and I did believe that Democrats and our policies were better for working people, you know, like myself, you know, and, but that's what makes me cringe so much after I find out what messy Mike did, what all he's doing. And especially when he talks about workers, I I would just cannot believe that a Democrat can go around. I mean, it just makes, I mean, I get sick to my stomach every time he says, well, we're for the working people when I'm like, okay, during that time I was getting paid. I I had uh, committed because I was supposed to get that money until November. And so I committed to paying my, my grandson 
us daycare because I'm not going to go into, you know, personally what was going on with me. Because you wanted to be a good grandma. That's all that is. Hey, Grandma Clater can provide something and she wants to. She wants to do something for her grandbaby. That's what happened. More to it than that. But I mean, but at the end of the day, that's the story. Okay. That's what happened. I'm paying $180 a week. Right. For daycare. Now, Miss Mathematician, can you take that for us dumb folks out to monthly? 720? Yeah. So then, so I was doing that. And then with, along with that, you've got to buy clothes. You got, you know, provide diapers for the daycare. Right. You were making good. You were making a decent wage off of this gig. You were doing it well. Nobody can begrudge you for making good money. Not good. It wasn't even good money. Let's, let's not be ridiculous. But you, nobody can begrudge you having a job that you do well and getting paid for it. Now, you do your other work. So this was a second income. This was like bonus money almost. So you didn't yeah. necessarily, you don't need it, but you had it. So then you have these commitments, though. You've made these commitments to your grandson and you get fired. That's the story here. So there was this obligation that you made. And what are you going to do? Tell your grandson, no, sorry, messy, mean Mike. He said, he said, no, no daycare, no, no clothes. We're going to have to just go back to the way things were. No, you're going to go out and you're going to do those things still because you said it. You're a woman of your word. Unlike Mike Pushkin. It's just, it's crazy. So since that time to pay for that. So, so I'm more like a gig worker anyway. So most of my money comes in after the end of the fiscal year. You re really this month. That's when my income flow generally comes. Mm -hmm. And normally, and I, I can make it a whole year. But I'm like right, you're an accountant. Virginians. You budget. So I'm like most West Virginians, though. Right, you know, I got you. Living has went up. You know, I've had to budget. I've had to scrape. I've had to pull everything together. And when that income that I had, you know, was depending on to cover these costs and then also the extra costs of just living, then I had to um, work two jobs. So mm -hmm. I started doing door dashing because that was the quickest way to legally make money. Because we wouldn't want Mary and Clayton to be out there illegally making any money. So I kind of would. I would really enjoy that. I can't lie. I want to yeah. hear the stories. You know, and the money, and it does come right then. You know, you don't have to go say, I, if I went out and got a job, which I, I really couldn't go out and do like a full-time job. Right, because you have other you have other work that you actually have to do. Because yes, you have, you, have you make money. money. Right. Yes, and so... I decided, you know, so I, I was doing that. So I was getting up early in the morning doing that. I do my other work a little while during the day, go out at night. I mean, one night I was out from the 1130 to 1 a.m. shift. So, I mean, I'm a worker. Unlike uh, Bessie Mike, who is probably, has, I mean, I heard he comes uh, Listen, I would love to get 30000 a year plus a per diem. Day. I mean, I don't know if it's true or not, you know, about him and, he, you know, that he comes for money, that it's just because, you know, he had that, um, you know, what happens sometimes when you have, he's a, you know, recovering addict and, um, which I, you know, I applaud him for his recovery. And so may, you know, and then, you know, how your family kind of, I mean, your family has to kind of cut you off sometimes. Mm -hmm. when you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, I, the ministry work that I've done, you know, I understand this. I've seen it. And um, so, I mean, so I don't, it, it may not be true. I don't, I don't know. I don't know about the, it's just been a rumor that they said that he does actually come from, um, you know, people who have some good mean, you know, means of income. I don't know if that's true. I do not. We're going to go with it. Sure. But we're just saying that it's, again, it's a rumor. We're not saying if it's true or not, that's what we've heard. And, you know, honestly, here's the thing. If you can even believe it, if like, that's a story that you can believe, maybe there is some truth to it. Um, just in the era, you know, that supercilious attitude that a lot of these people have when they talk to us about us, well, when just they in general, the air that they have around them. 
<laughs> well, it's that, that level of privilege that you've been used to in your life. And so you talk down to people because even though you may have been knocked down a peg because your family didn't agree with, you know, maybe the lifestyle that you live. I mean, this is in any, you know, this happens with a lot of times in families that uh, you're certain well, drugs, for example, uh, you know, you might do yeah, an intervention and say drugs. you're cut you off know, your lifestyle. When you come, you know, you come out to be your true self, you know, when it, when family can turn on you. Yeah. You know, your sexuality, your, you know, gender that, identity, that anything, gender identity that people, family members sometimes will turn their backs on you, but I don't know if, but sometimes it just seems like even when I would feel like if that happens to you, that even though you enjoy the level of privilege before that happened, you know, when you were doing what your family wanted to do, you were, mm -hmm. you know, not being your own self, that level of privilege, that attitude, I guess, of privilege, I've seen that that attitude of privilege seems to still stay with them, even though they went through something that you would feel like they would be more receptive to what other people are going through. And, and that's, I think that's the reason that I'm more sensitive to other people's plights because I haven't lived. I have never had any level of privilege, you know, I'm just, I, no, haven't had, I, I, I think haven't you've had, had uh, Marianne, listen, I feel oh, like I we're on the verge of privilege. reverse racism here and I won't stand for it. <laughs> I just haven't had that level of privilege. So I am sympathetic. I am empathetic. No, I, I don't want to say sympathetic. I want to say empathetic. I'm empathetic to what other people are going through. And, but it seems like these, some of these men are not. It's like they still hold on to that attitude of privileged, even when they've lost some of their privilege because of family members. Right. Well, yeah. and you're even talking about beyond regular, normal white privilege here. We're talking about wealthy white privilege, which yeah. isn't in and of itself its own monster. I mean, that is the ultimate yeah. form of privilege. Those are the ultimate. I mean, because, you know, a lot of people living in poverty, they don't they don't understand white privilege. I've never gotten anything. OK, but that's not exactly what we're talking about. But trust me you're not you're not even on the same level as people who come from that wealthy background it's not the right. same conversation it's a different yes that's yeah. different i know a lot of people and i honestly think when we are talking about that privilege that's the type of privilege that most of us are talking about i don't mm -hmm. think it's really, right because i always say like the policing issues that we have in the black community it's poor whites have that same issue I mean, maybe, maybe not as badly if you look at the numbers, family. but even still, it's the it is you bad. I realize that I'm in a community where we are a mixed community, and I've heard the stories that young white men tell me about. Oh, they kill they kill family. white people. I mean, I've they kill them all the time. Even around here, I'm talking. You know, there was I just mean, a guy in Beckley, was it? And they he got shot in front of the mall. Uh, it's, yeah, it's that they. If they think that you don't have anybody that's going to come to your defense, they will treat you any kind of way. Because you notice on the TV when they pull over the NFL player that happened to be black because they, they didn't realize that's who it is. The next day, I mean, not even the next day, immediately we're getting apologies. Right. Let's get apologies that's for everyone else. It does have a lot to do with wealth. It does. It does. A lot of it, it comes down to it. Right. Yeah. Not to say that, you know, black people don't get pulled over because they're black. Right. Right. But there is a certain look of a young white man in Appalachia that will get pulled over, too. Mm hmm. Right. And, you know, don't underestimate. I say I had a conversation with a cop around here one time. And she told me that she looks for dented cars, scratched cars, cars with broken windshields, and she'll follow them looking for traffic offenses so that she can pull them over and snoop around for drugs. Because those are the kind of people she says that do drugs. Poor people who don't get their car fixed. That's how she tells. Because if they had, if they, they have money for something, 
and it's not fixing their car. It's drugs. Uh, I don't think so. You're just persecuting poor people, but whatever. I know. Well, that's what we're on, the persecution of poor people. We've been on that. I was like, what are they trying to do? Go back to the poor houses. You know, it's like with the homeless. I mean, we had Democrats that were trying to put through bills. Oh, yeah. What? Come on now. And, but you know, I'm holding the wealthy person that has let their property go under that hmm. that's become a haven for the homeless or drug addicts or whoever to go into. Oh, no, we don't want to keep make them responsible for their own property. We want to try to set up laws that, you know, dehumanize and criminalize Right. The homeless person that decided to go into that property that has not been kept up. Yep. No, it's evil. The rumor is, you know, Mike supported one of those bills, but I, you know, rumor I has know. it. I don't know. Now, I'll tell you this we're talking about bad Democrats, and we've been on this for, call for, for an hour already. So,